Welcome to Supernatural Circumstances, the podcast where we take you down the rabbit hole into the fantastic world of the strange, the paranormal, and the unknown. I'm Morgan Knutson. And I am Mike Brown. It's time to dim the lights and settle in. Come along with us on this week's adventure. It's nice that we're doing a uh, Canadian case, eh? Eh? Yeah. A? Seeing as that's my jam, that's <laughs> that's my thing. Yeah, Jeff... Uh, is a pretty cool guy. I'm really looking forward to our conversation with him. I like that he does fiction and is interested in cryptozoology and sort of puts his knowledge of that topic into his fiction as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And this is such an interesting case because it really blends a lot of folklore, a lot of psychology, and mm -hmm. just something that stuck around in Canada for a really long time. And, and a lot of this level of folklore, I find, doesn't really tend to stick around in Canada very long, stories like this. Usually, like, we'll get a lot of tales that are a little bit more uh, older, I guess, uh, maybe First Nations-based or whatever, but this truly is the monster under the bed story. This is the only urban cryptid that I really uh, know about. I mean, we're talking about the Toronto Tunnel Monster or the Cabbage Town Tunnel Monster, and um, it's really strange. I, I don't think I've heard of any other cryptids in Canada that live in a big city or that have been seen in a big city. I shouldn't say live in a big city because who knows if it lives <laughs> still. Right. <laughs> this was uh, quite some time ago, 1978. So maybe, maybe it's uh, passed away, a, a natural death. It, but it, uh, you never know. <laughs> well, you, you don't. <laughs> So. You never know. And it, what's neat, neat about this to me is that Canada, for people that are, are listening, our, our audience here, we have so many of these underground tunnels within our cities. Mm -hmm. It's extensive. Like, mm -hmm. I, And there's a lot of, of places in America as well that, that sure. have this, but it, yeah. it is really extensive in Canada in, in areas that I don't think a lot of Canadians realize. I, I, we don't really think that way in re, in regards to our, our cities and things like that because Canada's just not that old. Right. But we've got so many of these hidden places. And, you know, maybe that's one of the reasons why the Cabbage Town Tunnel Monster has, has survived so many decades is that it is a really unique story in a country that doesn't really think that way about, about themselves. Strangely, there was only ever one sighting. And it was by a guy who wouldn't give his last name. He just wanted everybody to call him Ernest. And he said it looked like a red-eyed monkey, essentially, at first, until it spoke to him. So... <laughs> Which, by the way, is terrifying. Right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if I, nothing else happened in this story other than this guy saw a red-eyed monkey that talked to him, if, like, if that was the only thing that happened in this entire situation, that would be enough. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, let's get on with this conversation, and uh, let's talk to Jeff Dupuis. Let's do it. This is a very unique story, very unique case, and... Jeff, boy, are we glad that you're here to explain it all. So welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, this is so interesting because, I mean, we cover stuff from all over and it's so neat when it comes back to our Canadian home. Mm -hmm. How did you first discover this story in your travels? It was a story that I've heard through different um, kind of cryptozoological circles in, in, that I travel in. When people find out that I was writing novels about uh, cryptids, they would ask, oh, are you going to do the Cabbage Town Tunnel Monster? And I, at first, I had no idea what that was. And then, of course, I felt almost like an idiot for not knowing what that was. So I did a deep dive into it. And right. uh, it's kind of an obsession now. Yeah, I believe it. I mean, it is it is really mysterious. And Mike, you've talked a bit about this on Dark Poutine as well. Yeah. In one of my episodes, I think it was episode 175, I was talking about a whole bunch of cryptids, but 
this story I stumbled stumbled onto, and uh, I was just fascinated, especially that this tunnel monster hanging around Cabbage Town, Toronto. Do you want to sort of describe the area for us a little bit? What kind of place is Cabbage Town? So Cabbage Town was principally an immigrant community. Uh, it got the name Cabbage Town from the Irish population that lived there. Um, and it is, it's on the edge of, like the eastern edge of what would be considered downtown Toronto. So you have a, a bunch of old brownstones, a lot of Victorian homes, and then a lot of apartment buildings as well. So you have kind of an, an interesting mix, especially now, of very expensive homes. And then, I mean, I'm using finger quotes here when I say affordable apartments, uh, <laughs> because nothing is affordable here. Right. But <laughs> it's, it's quite the gap, uh, an income gap now. And I think it's always sort of been that way, at least in the um, 20th century, because that was like what we talk about now about rising real estate prices and gentrification and all that. That was a big thing that came up when I was doing research into the area in the 1970s to kind of understand the environment, which this story grew out of. And it was there basically the news broadcasts mm -hmm. from the era talk about the exact same things we're talking about in news broadcasts now. So it's a nice, quiet kind of part of almost downtown. I've driven through Don Valley and like by the Don Valley Parkway and through there and I didn't even know much history about it and I was there shooting uh, haunted hospitals at the time and I remember going through there and it's such a unique area all the houses are so interesting and it was I in your article you were talking about Cabbage Town and its meaning which is in the 1940s the Irish immigrants actually grew cabbage in the gardens and it, yeah. yeah and that that's that's where it started and that's why it's got such a strange name but but this particular <laughs> this strange incident started in what 1979 78 and, was it 78 with a report and a photo by Lori Goldstein so can we talk about this a little bit cuz this is the one of the strangest tales out of this country, I think, that, that has come up. So yes, the, the initial encounter, or the only encounter, uh, took place in August of 1978. Um, the story was reported in 79, but the encounter itself was 1978. And it was a, a warm August, and a 51-year-old man named Ernest, who lived in an apartment building in Cabbage Town uh, with his wife, Barbara, uh, was tending for a litter of kittens. And one of the kittens went missing. And now it's not 100% clear why he decided to look where he looked, which was a, kind of a, a crevice beside his apartment building that you had to climb 15 feet down the wrong side of a fire escape, is how it's described in the article, to get to it to see a very narrow uh, tunnel passage. But he ended up going there to look, and, and later in the article it talks about how he heard noises coming from the tunnel, but it's unclear if that's what drew him there. Uh, but he, he went to a tunnel uh, looking for this kitten, and he brought his uh, flashlight, and he basically just began to crawl into the tunnel. He didn't get very deep in it. And then about 10 feet into the tunnel, he sees this creature that he describes as being about three feet tall, he, is, he guessed it weighed about 30 pounds with slate gray fur and glowing red-orange eyes um, with visible like, fang-like teeth. And so he was petrified, obviously, as one would be. Um, but what the, the creepiest and most unique thing about the story is that the creature spoke to him it, in, a, in a hissing voice. It said, go away, go away. And so it didn't take him long to just you know, scoot back out of that tunnel and <laughs> go back to his apartment building and I assume lock the door. Do what the weird red-eyed shadow creature says. Exactly. I agree with him. I mean... Yeah, and and it was something that he, he was visibly shaken, according to his wife, and he didn't really talk about it outside of his uh, close friends and family. And it, it, I think it's important to note, he didn't seek publicity. He like I said, didn't didn't talk about it to anyone except those very close to him. And then somebody very close to him kind of spilled the beans to uh, the Toronto Sun reporter, Laurie Goldstein, who would have been 
with the newspaper for about a year by that point. Uh, now, Laurie Goldstein is a very kind of prominent member of Canada's journalistic community. I think he was editor-in-chief at The Sun for a while, the Toronto Sun. And so he he's not... He's not some nobody. He's uh, like a very prominent journalist now and uh, has quite the reputation. So I think that, you know, that goes a long way when reporting a story like this. But he, he went to Cabbage Town to visit Ernest and his wife and see their apartment. And then and this was in 1979. And then he went to investigate the tunnel with Ernest. And he, as I described earlier, it was he climbed 15 feet down the wrong side of this fire escape and this very narrow passage that apparently used to open out onto the street and no longer did by that point. And they went to investigate the tunnel and the top of the tunnel had collapsed. So they could not, like an adult human could not fit into it any longer. But they did find a partially buried body of a cat, um, which goes kind of speaks to what Ernest was saying about hearing. He thought he had heard animals being tortured or in pain coming from the tunnel when he first went to investigate it. So that's all they could find. And then uh, Lori Goldstein contacted the city and the city works department took a look at the tunnel. They doubted that it reached into the sewer system, but they didn't know where it went and nobody could get in to kind of further investigate it. Um, one thing I should have said earlier uh, is that the, the tunnel monster itself disappeared down a separate branching tunnel to the main tunnel um, after saying, go away, go away. So there's clearly a network of tunnels in this spot. Oh, it's, it's so creepy. Like <laughs> it's just, it's just so creepy. But I mean, it, it was interesting to me as a, as a researcher looking at this case that Lori really felt that Ernest was, was really credible with this. Cause I mean, I know for me, that's one of the first things, you know, I'm looking at is what are, what is the person's intention coming forward with this story and you know, where are they going to take this story? You know, it, it, are there either witnesses? Is there something to back this up? Like, you, you know, what, what's going on? But the, the, that credibility is, is so massive. So the fact that she just felt like, you know, this guy's not doing it for attention. He's, he's bringing this to the table, you know, honestly. And from what I understand too, he never pursued this in terms of other shows or other newspapers. He was just, he was done. Exactly. Ernest didn't seek out publicity. Once he got a certain level of kind of publicity because the story was so big for the Toronto Sun, it's not like, he, it's not like Ernest ever thought, oh, I can capitalize on this opportunity. And he told his story. Uh, he apparently n never contacted the paper again. So he never saw the creature again, which was sort of his understanding that he would reach out uh, if he were to have another encounter. So it seems to be this one and done encounter that Ernest didn't try to make a name for himself off of. And I think that's added something more to the legend. But the things that came out afterwards post this encounter, do you think they bear any weight? Like I, I know uh, Freaky Encounters did a show at one point uh, and they really added to this story. And, and this is where some of these stories get so difficult as to what's folklore, what's not, you know, where does the truth end and begin and so on and so forth. Um, but you had mentioned it in the article as well that uh, the rumor had it that Toronto sewer department came in and inspected the tunnel system because they were afraid of what was down there might go after kids um, that they took this seriously as well. Like, is, is there any credibility to that? Or was that just the TV show deciding that they were going to add to this? Yeah, that was kind of an addition to the story that the show, it was the show's interpretation that, that the city works department looked at it because they were afraid they were afraid something was actually down there. My understanding is they looked into it because you can't have a deep tunnel network without barriers preventing children from climbing in. Because you can imagine, I mean, mm -hmm. I crawled into things I should not have when I was a kid. <laughs> and you can just imagine that a lot of kids would do the same. Yeah. <laughs> I think those of us, especially with an interest in the supernatural, oh. the paranormal, death, we have that kind of mindset, probably going back to being kids, where, oh, dark dark tunnel? Like, sign me up. Well, well, I grew up and then ended up investigating dark tunnels. So <laughs> there is there is that. It, and Mike and I were actually having this discussion before 
the, before the show and talking about the, these various tunnel systems. And the, the one thing, I mean, I, I'm from Edmonton uh, in Alberta, and it's it's interesting here because there is an extensive tunnel system. Most of them were uh, mines, uh, coal mines and whatnot underneath the city. And most people don't realize that. And, and as a, as a job and one of the shows that I was filming way back in like 2008, um, one of the things I got to do was be able to go down into these, these tunnels and these mines and take a look at these things. And it does, I mean, you can't help but have your mind wander when you're down in some of these things. It's, it's, there it's like stepping back into a piece of history it's so fascinating and i know the show came out again and mentioned something about they they brought on a local satanist and they were interviewed and he was talking about that the creature collapsed the tunnel like he had this guy added a whole nother story to the cabbage town tunnels as well what happened how did we get to satanists (laughs) well that's sort of the the nature of the way these television series work. Um, the Satanist you're, you're mentioning, uh, Salako uh, Kaufu, he also was the head of the Occult Research Bureau, so uh, kind of a paranormal investigation group um, that I, I can't tell what how much they've actually investigated or how large the organization was. It, it's now defunct. But that is... Pr- probably why they brought him on or brought him on just because he's a kind of a local character to add some color to the program. But uh, yeah, they're really, I mean, there's no evidence that the creature tore the tunnel um, it down as, as he kind of stated, it's, it seemed like it wasn't a very well construct, like an intentionally constructed tunnel to begin with. Uh, the sewer workers that were interviewed in the original article seemed to think it was created through erosion and, um, poor drainage, essentially. So it didn't sound like it was a very safe place to be. So perhaps when the creature told Ernest to, you know, get out of there, he was doing him a favor. <laughs> well, that makes sense to me. I mean, you know, the, the funny thing is, I think we, we often, you know, strap these cryptids and spirits and stuff with these bad stories and these awful things. And I mean, who knows, maybe if he, he did a venture in there and experience something you know maybe it was for the for the positive so that brings us to the the big question i think which is is if ernest is telling the truth and what is it well yeah that to me is is what makes this story so fascinating because the fact that the creature spoke to ernest really doesn't make it a cryptid any longer because a cryptid is just an unknown animal this this to me is something more supernatural because it could speak um if yeah if the account is is 100 accurate it, it we're not and we don't hear reports of there being an unknown ape or or unknown monkey-like creature in and around the city which we would expect uh i mean if you compare it to something like sasquatch you'd expect to have more eyewitnesses because animals behave like animals they have to go and get food they have to go and find mates Whereas this thing did seem to be something of a, like I said, a supernatural sort of uh, creature. And that's one of the the theories that have been put forward in the cryptozoological community that uh, some people have kind of surmised that it could be what indigenous populations in, in this whole region call a memaguezi, which is a river spirit that is, you know, about that size, like a small person size or like a small kind of child size gray fur, and um, though it lives on riverbanks and not in tunnels, it has been put forward that because so many of our streams, creeks, and rivers in Toronto have been covered over in the construction of the city, we have a vast network of underground rivers. So some have speculated that it could be a spiritual creature that stays near water, but is now kind of trapped. That's interesting. There's a... uh, uh a legend in California as well, or again, sort of lore. A lot of people will tell you that this is completely true uh, about a very similar thing, which in uh, in California near the Tule River, which is called water babies. And the water babies are kind of the same idea, but they're a little more goblin-esque. Like, I, don't, I don't think they've got fur, but they're supposed to be sort of goblin-esque, but they, they live in the, the water and they're these, these water spirits that you, you, know, you don't want to anger. They're and it 
it's it's neat when you go back into some of this lore, which is often indigenous, uh, uh, talking about these these otherworldly creatures, cryptids that sort of have one foot in, one foot out of this world, and that usually they they're here for a reason. Like they're here because their land has been torn apart, or there's been something that's gone on within within the lives of these things that are almost coming forward to tell us, Hey, you know, you guys, you guys need to, to back off of, of what's going on. So it's, it's interesting that, that this also has that component. I find there's, there's always a truth somewhere in, in stories like this. And, and I think that's really interesting, but this gets even weirder because, and this took a turn that I did not expect by the way, in your article, which is this idea of underground bases in Toronto and a very strange character named Commander X. This is, as I say, a turn I did not expect, Mike. I'm sure you didn't either. No. <laughs> this is so strange. So can we talk about this a little bit? Because this is wild. Definitely, yes. Um, this story kind of, it, it has a few branches to it. We've kind of talked about the the branch of, is this just some kind of wild, dangerous animal? Like the Freaky and Encounters episode portrayed it. Is it the kind of supernatural being that we have in indigenous uh, folklore and even European folklore? Or is it, you know, connected to extraterrestrials? And that's where it really gets, uh, yeah, it does get wild. Because the story, because Ernest didn't do media appearances, uh, he didn't write a tell-all book, the story kind of went dormant before the internet age because you didn't have, it being rehashed on blog after blog. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of went dormant until it appeared, at least the earliest thing I could find it reappearing in is a book about underground alien bases by the person who writes of the pseudonym Commander X, who claimed to be uh, you know, a high up military American military officer. And so he claims, uh, I'm assuming, sorry, I'm assuming it's a he, claimed that uh, there are underground alien bases all throughout the greater Toronto area and around Lake Ontario. And that is something that had been put forward in the work of other writers. Uh, and there's a book from the seventies called uh, the Great Lakes Triangle, I believe. I believe the author is Jake Gorley. And Commander X kind of mixed a bunch of these kind of legends together. So you have this idea of underground alien bases, and then you have this creature that is underground that's this bipedal english speaking creature that ernest encountered which very well could be extraterrestrial now merged with this idea is one that is kind of a urban legend around the city of toronto that there's a particular intersection church a church in gerard that has all these freaky electromagnetic uh, phenomenon that happens. In, and it's claimed that there's an increase of car accidents there because the, the magnetism messes with automobiles. And it's supposed to be sort of a, an epicenter of strange phenomenon. Now, I, I personally haven't found a lot to back that up, but it's worth noting that that's within about a kilometer and a half to two kilometers from where this tunnel monster was sighted. So Commander X sort of merged that uh, with his own encounter of uh, seeing a strange creature on the streets of Toronto at four in the morning, which, I mean, who hasn't that happened to <laughs> if you're in the city? Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it became this kind of mixture of one thing almost adding credibility to another. And I mean, growing up in the area, I've long since... You hear a lot about UFO encounters over Lake Ontario. Um, the one time I saw a, a flying object I can identify was over Lake Ontario. So I see where that comes from and why it makes sense almost that these things could coalesce and kind of become part of the same legend. But uh, Commander X's assertion that there are, yeah, underground bases slash ancient cities beneath Toronto, I have yet to back that up in any way. I think what's interesting about that is that coincides to me with so many other areas, Mike, that you and I have, we've talked about this before on the, mm -hmm. on the show, like so many other areas that seem to have this combination of weird cryptids, 
electromagnetic anomalies in the area, um, UFO sightings or strange lights and things like that. And they all seem to be tied together. Like there seems to be these pockets of areas that have this type of phenomenon. Uh, you know, of course the most popular one now is, is Skinwalker Ranch. Um, but I mean, we've got them here in Edmonton, uh, a while back, one was covered on Alaskan killer Bigfoot and the uh, history of Portlock, Alaska. Um, there's these areas that seem to have these electromagnetic anomalies that are most likely generated from like a, a Geo, some sort of geological anomaly or whatever um and but they seem to be accompanied by these reports of these really really strange creatures and i find that very intriguing i mean could could this area of toronto for example be one of those areas and it was just developed well it's going back to this idea that i mentioned about underground rivers and and the tunnels we have beneath the city it, there is a lot that goes on beneath the streets that we don't know about and this particular on the east side of toronto because i'm from the east side of toronto i know more about the lore on on that side of the city compared to the west end but it's an area that stretch especially cabbage town it's known for hauntings uh, we have the tunnel monster we have this supposed underground base it, it just seems to be kind of a a hub of high strangeness for the city. And I think that sort of feeds into to what you're saying, that these things have these epicenters. Yeah, that's how it comes off to me is that there's there's some sort of, I don't know, there's there's something going on in the world that I, I don't think people have really touched on to, to the degree that we, we probably could. And I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, some of Commander X's stories strike me as pretty out there um i know <laughs> yeah. he he brings up uh something called the daros and i mean the daros that goes back for the for the audience to a, a guy by the name of richard sharp shaver um and he would kind of write these these you know crazy fictional alien stories and then the people would jump on them and you know and create lore based off these stories so so there was a whole sort of science fiction era there so there's i mean there's so many areas of this commander x that kind of lose they lose me but um i it, i do find it interesting though that that some of this kind of connects the dots uh, yeah it's it's another one of those kind of strange rabbit holes that we tend to fall down into in this show we begin talking about a cryptid and then we sort of end up talking about you know uh interdimensional extraterrestrial ultra terrestrials weird beings that uh it, this may or may not be and and it's so fascinating to me that every single guest we bring on we tend to have the conversation go in this direction and it's not even us directing the conversation no. it's like we didn't we didn't plan to talk about this this is just how it comes up it's very strange well i look at uh, say the work of commander x and i see that like what commander x did was basically draw conclusions from several disparate sightings uh the ufo sightings over the great lakes especially lake ontario uh the weird electromagnetic phenomenon this this creature sighting and so although i don't kind of go along with all of the conclusions it's like i go back to the sightings like that the fact that all of this has been seen in this area is is really fascinating to me so though i might not go all the way down the kind of shaver mystery side of it um i just i just find it remarkable that it's all in the relatively the same area well i think it's got to be looked at i mean it's one of these things that again it's it's as we go along i mean back in the 1970s nobody was looking at this stuff nobody was looking at the idea that there are these areas in the world that seem to have these these really strange phenomenon going on and now we have the advantage of not only hindsight but looking back and piecing some of this th this together did was there ever any any conclusion about who commander x was do do we know not that i'm aware of i did try looking into it because with a story like this it's so hard to get anything kind of concrete that you can put your hands on so i tried to i'm still working on figuring out who ernest himself was and then i thought okay well if i can find out who commander x is and maybe reach out to him or a colleague if he's still around which i i sort of believe that commander x is no longer around given that the the frequency at which books were being published and now have completely stopped makes me think that he's just not around anymore 
um, because he's, he was writing in the 80s and early 90s, and that is, you know, quite some time ago now, as my gray hair is telling me. <laughs> <laughs> this story, even though it sounds so, so strange, it's very similar to the original case of, or the original experience of the Beast of Bray Road in Elkhorn, Wisconsin, which was a, a dogman case for the, the rest of the audience. Um, and what happened there was there was a, a I believe he was a, he was a cemetery worker and the guy had been out this is in the 1930s the guy had been out and he noticed it, in the middle of the night this great big bipedal dog dog man uh, digging up one of these graves and he went over to figure out what was going on because he didn't realize at first that this was a bipedal werewolf and he went over thinking that this was just a dog and it turned around and stood up same glowing eyes sort of the very similar story it looked at him and said uh, uh something in another language and uh he freaked out and ran because he didn't expect this thing to talk at all uh, and the next night he went back and it was there again and it was again trying to dig up this 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 grave but what's interesting about this on top of the fact that the to me the encounters share some similarities is the fact that the the areas in which we're talking are again really similar we've got the uh, weird electromagnetic issues we've got uh you know you know strange things that have been seen in the sky we've got this this cryptid that it seems to be coming out of nowhere if it is a cryptid. Uh, and again, like just really, really, really similar. And it's, to me, it's, it's very interesting that these things seem to be able to speak. They seem to be able to communicate relatively well. There's even been talk of, uh, at, at some points of, of people communicating with, with Sasquatch and stuff like that. So I don't know. It's, it's really interesting. Like what's your take on the, the fact that these things are, seem to be vocal? That is something that I really have a hard time wrapping my mind around, uh, because to me that that is instantly what I would say supernatural rather than cryptozoological. Like this is not an animal that has somehow mm -hmm. figured out human speech. This is something beyond. This is something almost um, spiritual to you to use that term. And yeah, that it. I just grasp at straws when it comes to that sort of thing because there's, you know, there's so much history, tradition, mythology, um, going back to our, our earliest ancestors, and it's really hard to kind of find something that that fits so perfectly uh, to describe it. I don't know. It's it's this is I guess what keeps me involved and keeps me interested in this sort of thing is that I can't. My rational mind can't wrap around it. Yeah. Oh, I hear you. It's here in, in Alberta, we've got every cryptid spiritual thing you can possibly name and Sasquatch, Dogman, UFOs, everything. And, you know, I've seen my fair share of, of the Dogman side of it, which is has been phenomenal. Uh, but yeah, I've never, ever had one speak to me. Like it, I've never had, I mean, I've, I've had dozens of encounters with them, have not ever heard one vocalize or anything like that. Um, some people are reporting things like telepathy and what I've never had that either. Um, but yet, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is such an interesting, interesting subject in terms of, you know, where do these, where do these things lie? Like if Ernest is coming to the table with something that's, that's real, uh, you know, maybe this was just, you know, audio pareidolia, right? Like maybe this is something where people are, are, you know, hearing a growl and maybe, I don't know, projecting their, their own interpretation onto a, onto a snarl or a growl. Like Mike, what do you think about that? Well, I'm just trying to figure out what you mean by audio pareidolia. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. So here's, here's a lesson for the audience. Here's a lesson for the audience. So, and this is something that we see come up oftentimes in on a lot of the websites, especially the cryptid websites, where people are visually po like they're posting a photo or something and visually believing that they see a like a face or a Bigfoot or a Dogman, and the rest of us are looking at it, going, "There ain't anything in the photo," uh, and but our brains are actually. 
they they work in in the sense that we recognize connections with in terms of faces uh, where our brains are searching for those connections because that's how we identify each other. We we can look at somebody's face and go, oh, that's so and so. So we're meant to discover faces and whatnot in abstract things of what we're seeing. That's why people say, oh, I just saw Jesus in my toast. Um, well, no, you didn't see Jesus in your toast. You saw a bunch of burn marks on your toast and that you your brain connected the dots and found Jesus. Uh, but <laughs> that's, that's visual pareidolia, but people also have it auditory as well. And oftentimes you'll hear it or you'll see it happen, especially with people recording things like uh, EVP, electronic voice phenomena, where they will come forward and say, you know, I, the, you know, this this entity told me that you know I was gonna die. It says I'm gonna die, and then you play back the the audio, and it's garble, and there's there's nothing there. But in their mind, they're genuinely hearing these these things that are you know sentences that they're putting together in their mind. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I wonder sometimes with these these people that are saying you know I heard these things growling or whatever, and then they're 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 placing words onto onto maybe noises that these things are making that I don't know maybe that they're maybe they're not making I don't know I've I've never heard it personally but that doesn't mean it couldn't happen It's like the videos of the cat you know saying hello to the Amazon driver Bingo. kind of thing yeah. yeah same idea So I I think like I would lean more towards towards that but I don't know Jeff what do you think about that Well and and to what you're saying too if it was in a tunnel with a certain echo effect it could very much um, add to the pareidolia that you're saying. So if, for example, I mean, most pragmatically, most skeptically, if I were to look at it just based on the description and the surrounding area, I'd say, okay, maybe you already saw a raccoon. Poor visibility. It's about that size, slate gray fur. And if it hissed, did he hear something um, through the echo of the tunnel being shocked because I think it, you're prone to misinterpret things when you're somewhat afraid or in a, in a, a heightened state of, of anxiety. So it is, I do think that is possible. Um, but I mean, there are just certain things in the stri- description don't fit raccoon. So I don't think that's the perfect kind of way to explain it away. But I, I do think the pareidolia element is something mm. to, to consider just because speech does seem like really incredible. I think in these cases, what I found really interesting, and this is this is such a great example of where I was horribly, horribly, horribly wrong about something. Uh, when these cases of of these cryptids like Dogman first started coming out, and people were saying, uh, you know, well, they don't have glowing eyes; they have it's it's eye shine. It's always eye shine. Uh, you know, it's it's that part of the eye that's reflecting light back, and the eyes look like they're glowing. And I was absolutely that person that was like that's what it is that's what people are seeing they're misinterpreting it and the first time that i saw it uh for real and uh it was it was dog man here in alberta it, those eyes were glowing like it was it's like an internal glow that i cannot explain for the life of me and they're so bright that they cast a light on the face of of the the creature and it it was shocking to me because I couldn't for the life of me, as I was looking at this, try to, I was trying to figure out where, where, you know, where the light source was coming from. This was absolutely not eye shine. There was no glimmer when it turned its head. None of that. It was absolute bright, bright points of light to the point where if you didn't know better, you would have thought that there was somebody standing there with two LEDs shining at you. Like, and it wasn't reflecting out that far, but it was, it was as bright as Christmas lights. And it really shocked me. So now I'm like, when people say, well, yeah, you know, it's maybe it spoke or something like that. I, I, I can't dismiss it. I mean, I've been, I've definitely been eating my words before in, in other situations. So, so there is that. So why do you think, Jeff, that these stories that, or that this particular story for, for all sense and purposes is has stuck around as long as it has. Is it because there's too little information? I think that's a big part of it. There, well, firstly, I think because Ernest only gave the one account, it, it didn't become a joke. It didn't become something easily dismissed as if, um, if we got to see this person on TV, on the radio, uh, trying to 
you know, basically discrediting himself. We, we didn't see that. So that helped preserve the story, I feel. And also, uh, as we sort of touched on, it can go in so many directions. It can be supernatural. It can be cryptozoological. It can be extraterrestrial. And not knowing, and, and none of these possibilities being easily eliminated uh, for those of us kind of in this community, it, it just, it, that gives it a certain kind of life. Um, it, it helps that it was in a major newspaper, that this was something that was broadcast, I believe, to enough people that it's, it is stuck in the public memory. And it's just so fantastic. And at once, incredibly supernatural, this, this, I, I, like this idea of a being living just under the kind of buildings that, in which we live that can speak, that has that kind of intelligence, but also not so far out there that it, it, it's easily dismissed. I think it's that right middle line, that Goldilocks zone of having enough elements that really fascinate us without being so out there that it can be dismissed by the vast majority of people. I wonder, too, how this story would have gone if it had have been or if it had have happened in the U.S. And the reason why I wonder about that is and. Uh, our mutual friend Brian Baker of the Superstitious Times, we've we've had this discussion at length before, which is, and Mike, you you and I have too, which is Canada's incessant need to not discuss paranormal things, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it, it, so it makes me wonder, like you know, if there maybe was more information that we're not hearing about, or there's been other encounters, like I because I, I know from personal experience, especially with things like like cryptids and things like that you have to unless you are knocking down somebody's door they are not likely to come out and and say anything like Ernest is not an anomaly in Canada for just not wanting to tell his story kind of getting pushed by the family to tell it I mean to me that is my classic experience of witnesses in Canada in general Uh, so it really makes me wonder you know if you were to go and talk to the locals one-on-one and hey if you're a local by the way that's seen this thing please email us <laughs> uh, but it makes me wonder if if there is more information that's out there because man it it's it really a different environment in Canada and I mean if it was in the states I I don't know would we be having more more people come forward would this be I mean we probably have tours of these tunnels I would imagine <laughs> if we were in the states I certainly agree. The uh, the U.S. definitely seems to have a better, well, I don't know if better is the word, but they are more vocal about these things. And uh, as you mentioned, Brian Baker, he and I have had this discussion and so much of it, I think, is partially because of the evangelical nature uh, of American society, a more heavily religious nature that it's not unheard of. It's You're not as doubted as much for seeing something that seems supernatural. Whereas here, and, and I, I might say Newfoundland is something of an exception, but here we're just very, uh, I guess, conservative in a paranormal sense. We, we don't talk about it. We're not open. Uh, we had kind of a, a golden age of spiritualism, uh, you know, after World War I, World War II time period. But aside from that, we don't have this um, vein that runs through our society the way the U.S. does. Yeah, my, my great-great-grandfather was uh, Albert Durant Watson, and he, he lived in, in uh, Toronto on uh, Euclid Avenue. And he, uh, he was one of the first paranormal researchers in Canada. And he ended up writing two books on, on seances that he he did and the experiments that he did there and what was interesting about that time exactly that time that you're talking about like 1918 um i mean when he came out even with his information at at that point and he was a very esteemed doctor uh very well-known poet astronomer i mean this guy had credentials like mad and he came forward with with the information that he did uh, about the afterlife and and the, the paranormal and things like that and he just got absolutely slaughtered in the media like it was 
it was horrible. I mean, he just about lost everything uh, to the point where he was quoted at one point as saying, like, why did I even do this? It was it was so bad. It, his colleagues came after him, everything. And it's 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 so interesting now because you look back on these books and you you read them. And I mean, he was so far ahead of his time in terms of what was being said and, and whatnot in, in these these books. But, you know, it just you, you look at these these areas and whatnot, and we haven't really changed all that much. I mean, we I mean, thankfully, people can come forward and, and whatever. But I know even like the producers of my show um, or some of my shows like haunted hospitals and stuff, it's rough for them getting stories like you get the people that really, really want to talk and both are their Canadian productions. You get the people who really want to talk and then you get the people who come forward that are like, you know, I don't want you to use my real name or, you know, here's my story, but I don't want to tell it on television. Uh, It's yeah, it's it's so it's sad in a way, because I think we're we're kind of missing out, especially in the case of the Cabbage Town Monster. I mean, we might be missing out on not only like the 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 paranormal and the investigative side, but also a piece of our, our history is kind of getting you know, decimated by, by the, the, the silence and the sort of this epidemic of silence, I think, that Canada's got. I, I just want to mention my great grandparents on my mother's side um, helped found the first spiritualist church in Toronto. Uh, so it makes me wonder if perhaps they crossed paths with. Uh, I just, sorry, did you say Albert Dern Watson? Oh, man, I bet they did because he. I did. Yeah. He, and he was, uh, he did attend a spiritualist church as well at one point. So I wonder they very well might have. I'm going to have to dig into that now. Wouldn't that be neat? Oh yeah. I would be, I would be fascinated because I like, he was, he was amazing. Well, yeah, I, I don't know much, uh, about my, my great grandparents. Uh, I have done some research in the history of Springdale church is the name of the spiritualist church. And I just, you want to understand the context. The context is the biggest thing for me uh, because we can look back on individual events like the Tunnel Monster or a spiritualist church or a UFO encounter or whatnot. But if you don't understand how the people themselves viewed it, you're missing a, a huge chunk of the picture. And so I, I would love to just kind of understand that world at that time and how people then viewed the supernatural because I'd imagine it's quite different from how we view it now. Oh, definitely. I mean, we've, I think we've got a, we've, we've got a different view. And I don't, I don't know necessarily if it's entirely better in some areas. I, you know, I think it's definitely improved. Um, you know, it's definitely more of an open subject. I mean, there's, there's so much more research now, uh, and whatever, but I, I have to say, like, I know with, uh, A.D. Watson's work, he brought such a beautiful, powerful, positive side to to parapsychology and he was really about the 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 hope and the the joy and all of that 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 can be brought out through understanding this connection that we have to to non-physical and uh the unknown and 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 things like that and i i think we've lost that to a to a degree um especially with the way the shows are structured now i mean we've got a lot of of stories that are just you know being warped deliberately for for fear factor where with like Ernest story for example I don't get that impression I don't think he was I, I get the the impression that the reporter was was genuinely just trying to report a story and I, I don't think that would be handled in the same way as it is as it is anymore I mean it today if that if he had to come forward you know, how would that story have been been twisted in the media and and turned around and changed and i mean mike you and i are talking about this all the time about how irritating it is that yeah. it's skewed <laughs> the conversation i think that needs to happen isn't happening because people are afraid that other people will think they're crazy well and, and to me i i don't i don't see like if, if somebody says oh this is what I, I saw you can you can think to yourself politely oh i think you must have misinterpreted the facts but that doesn't have to insult them in any way or question their credibility in any way. Uh, I go hiking a lot. I'm in the wilderness a lot. I often misidentify animals. Um, even, you know, when you have an upright dead tree with no branches on it, you just see it quickly as you're between other trees and you think there might be something there. If you don't get a chance to stop and examine it, you might, you know, misinterpret what you've seen and, and walk away. 
you know, thinking you could have seen a bear or a Sasquatch or, or something of that nature, you shouldn't be mocked for making that mistake. It's that happens. That's we have this intelligence as human beings that we should be investigating these things. And if somebody says they saw something, look into it. And if there's nothing to back it up, then you have to, that, that doesn't prove that it didn't happen. You just bear in mind that there's nothing maybe backing it up or that you think they saw something else and move on. It We're so judgmental of each other about this and so many other things that it, it, I wonder what we lose by not being more open. I couldn't agree more. I, I think I think that is that is ultimately what society really needs right now is that openness and that understanding, and uh, and and to admit to on the flip side of that that if you think you've caught something and people are saying you know I don't see it or whatever to accept it because I think that's the other side to this is where people are just they're digging in their heels about their beliefs so deeply on one side or the other that there's no room for movement anymore like it just doesn't seem to be it, it just doesn't seem to be as flexible maybe as it used to be <laughs> back in the day when I, I first started started all of this stuff but uh, Jeff this has been amazing thank you so much for coming on and and talking about this because it's so strange and so cool um where can people find you? Where can people read your stuff? Because I mean, you write for Superstitious Times. Uh, it's it's a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal sort of newspaper, online newspaper. Uh, can, but talk about that a bit. Where can people find you and and let us know? All right. Well, uh, Jeff Dupuis, all one word. dot ca is my website. So I have a list of all the articles I've written. Uh, links, I should say, to all the articles I've written for the Superstitious Times, as well as my three cryptozoological murder mystery novels uh, from Dunder and Press, the Creature X series. So basically everything I do is on jeffdepuy.ca. Um, but yes, do check out the superstitioustimes.ca uh, because that's great. And as we mentioned, Brian Baker several times already, he's great. And uh, it's a great publication, not just because I write for it, but because it's awesome. <laughs> And it has a good range of things it covers. Yeah, we will put links and everything um, up on social media once this airs. So thank you so much again. And it's been awesome having you. This has been one hell of a discussion. So we talked about the tunnel monster and we talked about some other things, which is always what happens on this show. Uh, well, and how weird does this conversation get with the conspiracies that really went off the charts around this subject, this this whole Commander X mm -hmm. tie-in and the alien tie-in. I mean, it, right. it's, it just goes so off the rails, this story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I wonder what Ernest would have said. Had he heard this now? <laughs> well, I, I wonder if it was Ernest from like Ernest Goes to Jail and, and that kind of thing. Maybe it was him. Maybe it was, he, that would explain some things. <laughs> that would explain some things. I don't know what Ernest would think uh, that it's developed into this thing. Like, I mean, the guy was just going into a tunnel to look after some kittens or so he thought. And and here was this thing, you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and so many stories about strange creatures like this, that's how it happens. You know, you're, you're just stumbling into this stuff. Mm -hmm. What's interesting to me is that it reminds me quite a bit of a story uh, known as the Enfield Horror, where a farmer ended up uh, discovering a strange three-legged alien on his doorstep. And it was, it hung around for a little bit and then, and then left. And it was, it was one of those, again, strange incidents where there wasn't too much else around the the occurrence but it just it happened and then it stuck in people's minds where mm -hmm. it was like what there's a three-legged alien what's <laughs> what is, i mean what two two-legged aliens are bad enough but why why the extra leg is they had that, to add a leg it just, right <laughs> yeah it's it's so fascinating to me and you know the fact that some of these things are seen i guess very rarely you know, many people will say, well, then that just must mean it's, it's, it's not true. And, mm -hmm. but it, that really, to me, it, it does make sense because I mean, if you've got a, a, a elusive animal of some sort, then oftentimes you're not seeing them a whole hell of a lot. You know, there's been, 
so many animals and and weird creatures and whatnot that have been discovered over the years uh, that you know people have had one sighting and that's the last time they saw them. So, you know, you never know. Yeah, and people are still seeing strange animals in places that they shouldn't be. I, I just read uh, this morning, uh, I saw a photograph that was taken last year in Maine, and it was of what somebody thought was a bobcat. And bobcats, apparently, this type of bobcat is extinct in Maine. However, that didn't look like any bobcat that <laughs> I've ever seen. So maybe it was something else. Maybe it was something undiscovered. You know, we 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 think, oh well, we live, uh, we we've got everything covered. There's there's nothing new. I mean, there's the ocean, and there's all kinds of stuff in there that we haven't seen yet. And uh, and who knows? Maybe there are things in our woods that we haven't seen, or perish the thought in the tunnels in the sewers underneath us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's part of the mystery of this planet is mm -hmm. that I don't even know if we'll get to the bottom of it. I mean, how many times have we talked about the idea that some of these these beings that people are seeing might be uh, more than what we imagine them to be, like might lean into that side of being non-physical, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that are disappearing and reappearing and things showing up and then vanishing right in front of people's eyes. So it's it's so hard to label something like this as as just a blatant folk story because there's so many various encounters that have happened over the years whether they be in woods like you were saying or uh you know just out in deserts in like navajo nation places like that where people are you know seeing these creatures kind of mm -hmm. like drifting in and out I mean, it's our our planet is more amazing than what we think it is right <laughs> I agree. And that's why we continue to do these things. And, and I'm looking forward to uh, more things to come. We've got some exciting stuff in the hopper. We, you know, I've said that a few times, but <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, you're right every time. And yeah, this is the fun of, of this universe that we live in and being able to explore it and talk about it and you know go down some pretty weird rabbit holes but i'm prepared and utterly fulfilled every time we go down one of those rabbit holes so <laughs> we gotta keep going <laughs> yes i agree so thank you for joining us on this eerie expedition dear listeners and remember the line between the natural and the supernatural is often a thin one until next time stay curious friends Supernatural Circumstances is a co-production of Entity Seeker Paranormal Research and Teachings and Good Egg Studios. This podcast is part of the Curious Cast Podcast Network. Theme music by Corey Johnson of Catalyst Records in Edmonton, Alberta. You can learn more about Morgan Knudsen at EntitySeeker.ca and learn more about me, Mike Brown, and listen to my show, Dark Poutine, at DarkPoutine.com. Feel free to email the show at supernaturalcircumstances at gmail.com.